It happens that way sometimes, right? Yeah. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. 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 You're in a good mood. Um, yeah, we are starting a new sermon series today. You can tell by the decorations out here. And I want to warn some of you that haven't been in church a lot before that uh, you know you're probably used to seeing like pictures of dead people on the wall and things like that, um, you know, some relics, icons, stained glass, we're lacking some of those things, and then we walk in and we have Alice in Wonderland and cards and things like that, so we're not a cult, you know, we're not going to ask you to drink Kool-Aid or wear Nikes or anything like that, it's going to be, it's going to be cool, if you wear Nikes, it's okay, no, nothing wrong with that, I just want to, just want to kind of get you into the feel of what the Edge Church is all about, but yeah, we're starting a new sermon series called House of Cards, and here's a nugget of truth uh, to start us off with, to kind of get kind to get us going. Everybody in here, if you know it or not, you may not realize this, but everyone in here has faith. Everyone in here has faith in something. Now what I mean by that is all of us assume this cause and effect relationship as it pertains to God or in the world in general. And it really doesn't matter what religion or faith group that you follow or that you come from. It's, if it's Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism, heathenism, voyeurism, it doesn't really matter which ism that you, you follow there. It doesn't matter. For example, if, you were to ask, if I were to ask you, how does life work? What's life all about? Your response would probably go something like this. Well, I think or I believe. I believe if I do this or don't do this, it will cause or not cause something good or bad to happen. I think, I believe. That's faith. That's what faith is. It's kind of like this. If you were to jump on a plane tonight, a plane to go to Vegas tonight, anyone here been to Vegas before? It's, you know, it's a fun flight, right? My wife, who's an interior designer, used to go out there all the time and design showrooms. And um, she said it's a party flight. Everyone's laughing. Everyone's in a great mood. You're slapping high fives with your neighbor there. You're dancing and singing. And there are great hopes. There's high hopes there. And if you stop and ask someone, why are you so happy? They'll probably turn around and go back to you and say back to you, I've got a system. I've got a system here. I've got it all figured out. I think I'm going to win this time. And the truth is, they cannot wait to get off of this plane and get down to the strip because they think they know how to beat the house, right? They may even flippantly say, I have faith or I believe. Now, I don't know what their faith is really based on. Maybe they, they heard there was a lucky table at the Bellagio, and on Thursdays a dealer was really crappy, so you could really wipe things, you could beat him and you know, take him out. Or maybe, maybe this is some of you, maybe they've read a book, and they've learned how to play blackjack, counting cards like a pro, and they've memorized it, especially chapter 3, right? So they're getting off that plane, and they're hitting Vegas with a faith system. And they're thinking, if I do this right, and avoid doing this wrong, then I'm going to get the results that I've been looking for. And they believe it. And they believe it enough to really risk some high stakes on this belief. And that's called faith, right? Now, skip ahead a couple days after, a couple days later on the flight coming home, and it's a little different, right? I mean, in fact, Sabre said it's very quiet. A lot of quiet. It's very quiet. People are shaking their heads and wringing their hands and saying, you know, what just happened? I don't know what just happened to me. I was so sure, and I don't understand. I mean, I followed chapter 3 to a T, and I've lost everything. It didn't work. I just want my mommy. I mean, that's the kind of thing you're thinking there. You see, there's a common tie between this Vegas principle and our faith sometimes. And this is true because many of us believe if I do this right or do this enough, then God will do this. If I have, you know, if I have enough faith, then it will cause, cause God to do what I want Him to do. And really... It's not surprising that many of us have this misconception about faith. And that's because in today's culture, thanks to, our, you know, to today's culture and also TV evangelists, we're getting this prosperity point of view in Dolby 5.1 surround sound, aren't we? I mean, for example, there's that guy on TV with the big church and the southern accent and the, you know, the kind of a, you know, the, the bad haircut. He blinks a lot, right? You know what I'm talking about? That guy there? And he says stuff like, if you have faith... 
you'll be successful. If you have faith, your business will grow. If you have faith, your diseases will go away. Your kids won't terrorize you any longer. And you have freakishly white teeth, just like me. <laughs> and for the record, if you don't get what you want, then you probably didn't have enough faith to begin with, right? But if you buy my book for $19.95, I'll tell you how to have faith. And so you're sitting there going, is that how it works? Really? Is that how it works? Are there stories like this? I was a lonely man. And then one day as I sat home and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, you know, for God to send me a wife, all of a sudden, boom, on the front porch, there was a supermodel driving a Porsche 911, slammed into there, jumped out of there. We fell immediately in love. We got married and now we have 14 kids. And if you pray and believe enough, you can have a supermodel wife too. Right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about this one? And this is a true story. A true story. A couple years ago, on an episode uh, during Shark Week, you guys like Shark Week? It's like awesome. Yeah. On one of those one of those episodes, there's this father and son in the water, and the son got attacked by the shark. True story. And the dad's trying to wrestle the son away from the shark, and he finally does. And, and there's blood and there's guts. It's just terrible. It's just a terrible scene. It was a real mess. So a helicopter swoops in and takes the kid to the hospital, and a group of family and friends are gathered together in the hospital and they're praying and praying and praying and uh, the doctors walk out and, the, and they, they say the boy's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. And then the father who is overwhelmed with joy tells a local news reporter God did this because we had enough faith. Is that true? Is that true? I mean, is it true that if I muster enough faith and perhaps so a golden lasso around God, then He'll grant my every wish? Is that how it works? I mean, is God in heaven saying, well, you know, I wasn't going to heal Him, but they faithed me into it, so now I have to do it. Is that, is that true? Right? I mean, think about it. What if the boy died? What if the boy died? Does that mean they didn't have enough faith? Think about it. Because you know what? Right up the hallway, there's another kid. And he got better. And his parents don't believe anything. Right? So how does that work? How about this? Here's my question. Here's my Eric Marshman question here. If they had enough faith, why didn't God keep the shark away from the, to, to begin with? Right? You see, why is it that a lot of us in this room sitting here right now, you know, you have faith, you love God, you read the Bible, and you pray every day, and we've been asking God to help us with our family, financial health, and relational issues, but we've gotten nothing. Nothing's happening. How do you explain that? Now, on top of that, there's this guy over there who not only doesn't believe, but he's a real jerk. And everything's going his way, right? Yeah, what's the deal with that? And, and for some of us here, maybe your faith is a little shaky right now. I mean, just be honest, maybe your faith is a little shaky now, and you're considering walking away from this whole God thing. Because over the last several years, you've been saying, this is what I believe to be true about God, and it's worked pretty well for you so far. But maybe in just the last few days, weeks, or months, maybe hours, I don't know, what have you been leaning your faith against? Moved. It changed. And now you're like Alice, Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole. And you're not sure what you really believe anymore, right? So you see, that's why this sermon series is going to be so important. Because we're going to look at what you, what you should be leaning your faith against. Because the truth is, if we're leaning our faith on anything except a true, solid, and unmovable foundation... It's just a house of cards. It's just a house of cards. And eventually, life will bump into your faith and it will collapse. You see, the truth is, all of us have a range of attacks on our faith, from little bumps to complete meltdowns. And it really comes down to two things. And this is the first one. This is on your program. The first one is this, unexplainable circumstances. Unexplainable circumstances. You see, we, we're all going to have circumstances that bump, 
the crash right into our life, in our marriage, our health, whatever, and we won't be able to explain it. We just won't. For example, let's say for your entire life, you thought that God would always take care of you, always provide for you, always protect you from the boogeyman, whatever that is. But now, it doesn't feel like He's really doing that. It's, it's kind of unexplainable, right? And maybe sometime in your life you believed or you were taught or you concluded that there was a system or a formula where if you do this, this, and this, then God will do that, right? And so you take this formula like currency and you place it in the slot machine and then you pull the arm, hoping that you found the correct uh, algorithm to provoke God into listening to what you're saying. So you say something like, I'll go to church three times and then I'll pray. Come on, God! <laughs> and then you get a lemon, two cherries, and one snozzle berry, right? Oh, crap. That was a Willy Wonka reference if you didn't catch that. Love Willy Wonka. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, that didn't work, God. I'll try another formula. Okay, God, here we go. I'll go to church four times. Then I'll pray and I'll drop some cash in the offering plate. <laughs> Crap, still didn't work. Oh, man, how about this? I'll go to church every time the doors are open. I'll pray without ceasing. And I'll do the hokey pokey and turn myself around. Because that's what it's all about, right? <laughs> ah, still didn't work. And so when this happens, our response is going to be, God, what's the deal, man? What's the deal? I did what I was supposed to do. Why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? I thought you were like this, but it feels kind of like you're like that, that you're not like this, and you won't be able to explain it, right? Now, the second challenge to our faith is called lifestyle decisions. Lifestyle decisions. Now, this would be where... Throughout your life, you've abided by certain moral standards, a, a moral compass, if you will. And maybe you've gathered these standards from your parents, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, wherever. So now you have this uh, innate sense of what's right and what's wrong. And every decision that you've made since that point has been filtered through, through this moral standard. But then something changed. For example, when we were kids... Most of us, I would say, most of us learning that, learned that drinking and driving and doing illegal drugs was a bad thing. We don't do it, right? Most of us heard that. Maybe we even, even got that little dare bumper sticker and we gave it to our mom and she slapped it on her car. And then we pinky swore with the rest of the third graders saying we will never, ever, ever drink and drive and do illegal drugs. Maybe it was just me, but I think that was pretty common for most of us. But then we go to college. Right? And I always said, you know, there's a time and a place for everything in life, and it's called college. You know? <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. So when we get to college, all bets are off, right? Now, you know, now we're with a new stable of friends, and though our old friends back in third grade understood and they shared those earlier beliefs, when we get in this new clique and we find ourselves standing around a bonfire and someone hands us something in a red solo cup or a sloppily rolled peculiar smelling cigarette from the left-hand side, we go, no thanks. I made a promise in third grade I'll never do that, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like the record skip. And all these people are going, what? And the people around the bonfire kind of stare at you because you're so different. You're different than what they are. And you begin to think to yourself, man, maybe I need to reevaluate this. If not, I'm, for the next four years, it's going to be pretty lonely. Okay? Yeah. So you end up tweaking what you believe to be important at one time, and you alter your lifestyle decisions a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here's another one. Most of us were raised to believe that lying, stealing, and cheating were a bad thing. And this is pretty common regardless of what religion you've, you've been exposed to or not exposed to, mostly. And most of us adults try to instill this principle in our kids' lives, call it sin, call it moral fa failure, whatever. And all that worked for us just fine. But then we got a job. And maybe this job was in an industry where lying, stealing, and cheating was business as usual. And you're looking at other people around you, and, and they're getting ahead in their, in, in their job, but you're not. And if you don't lie, steal, and cheat, you're not going to be able to keep up with the big dogs. So you have to make a decision. You arrive at a crossroads. So then you begin to weigh your virtues through the reality that you have a mortgage, 
you have braces and a credit card to pay off. So you make a decision. And it's just for the short term to begin with, right? You know, you make a decision to change your belief system about lying, stealing, and cheating. But soon, it becomes a routine part of your day. So you rename it creative business, right? And that helps you sleep at night. Right, yeah. So you see, this new loose dynamic of faith kind of turns into something, something we feel. It becomes emotional. And we can't put what we feel on the table next to God and make them both true. We can't make them both good. So something has got to give. You see, the commonality between these two faith landmines, unexplainable circumstances and lifestyle decisions, are both what? Circumstances. They're all based on your circumstances. I used to believe this, but now my circumstances have changed, so now I have to change what I formerly believed. And so this kind of belief system is called circumstantial faith. Circumstantial faith. You see, this is where my circumstances change, so my faith adapts accordingly to accommodate that. I used to believe this about God. I used to believe this about Buddha. I used to believe this about Oprah. Whatever it is, I used to believe this is true, and then something happened in my life, and I had to go back. I had to take a few steps back and rethink this, or move to a different faith system altogether that fits my new lifestyle. Now. There are a couple problems with, uh, with this thing we call circumstantial faith. Number one, circumstantial faith is extremely fragile. You see, just when you think you've got the formula down pat and you pull the handle and nothing happens, or at least not what you expect, it can feel very random and very chaotic, right? And then God be begins to feel very random and very chaotic. And since you've tried all these other formulas and they didn't work either, you may think about throwing in the towel on your faith, throwing in the towel on God. Now the other downfall to circumstantial faith is that we are not very good at interpreting circumstances, are we? I mean, what we think is going on and what is actually going on can be very different things. For example, when Dylan was very young, I'm, I can't remember the age exactly, but it was a time where you get the, the shots before school. So it may have been about four, something like that, maybe five. But um, I told Dylan we had to go out that day. And he took that as we're going to Dairy Queen, so he was happy. I, I didn't change the story. I was like, hey, okay, whatever gets, makes him happy and he gets in the car with me and everything works fine. But actually we were going to the doctor and it was shot time. So as it worked out, his, his, uh, his nana, his grandmother was an RN. So she was the one giving the shots. So Dylan gets in there and you know we, we drive by Dairy Queen. He's like, well, and he's a little confused. I mean, in psychology, that's called cognitive dissonance. You don't know what's going on. And he's, so he was experiencing cognitive dissonance. He just didn't know it. So we go by Dairy Queen and I, I turn into Nana's office, which he knew what that was. He knew what the doctor's office was. He's like, wait a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Something's not lining up. I don't think Nana has ice cream in, in her place of work. I don't think the doctor has ice cream. Anyway, we go inside. You know, didn't say anything about shots. Took him in the room. He sits on the little table with a paper and pulls his pants down and Nana says, hey baby, and she just jabs him with a needle, just like, whoop pow right in his leg. I mean, just so she'd catch him off guard and it wouldn't hurt as much, I guess, I don't know. But then he screamed. But he screamed one of those screams where your lips turn blue and they roll back. <laughs> and not, not any noise came out of his face whatsoever, nothing. It was one of those silent blue lip screams. And that's, that's what he did, yeah, yeah. And then it got worse because his Nana said, okay, you know, he didn't react real well to that when he kind of jumped. Like, I can't, can't imagine why someone coming at you with a needle while you wouldn't jump. <laughs> so she said, won't you hold him down? I was like, gosh, you are killing me because now I'm the bad guy. So I am having to hold his legs down, I'm not looking, and she goes, pow, and sticks him again. And he's like, ah, you know, it, it's just like, you, I, I felt like I was just, oh, I've just totally betrayed my son now. You know, he'll never trust me again. Now, if a camera crew would have showed up right there and asked Dylan, Dylan, what do you think of your daddy? <laughs> I don't think he would have handed me the Daddy of the Year award at that very moment, right? In fact, he probably would have said, my daddy is evil. Get him away from me right now. I don't like my daddy. And here's why. You see, to Dylan, in that moment, two thoughts were swirling around in his head. Number one, daddy doesn't love me. And number two, dad, this is your fault. You didn't protect me. You brought me into this hell. You know, in your mind, you can still cuss even at that age. You brought me into this hell, and I don't understand. 
Now, all of us parents sitting in here understand this. And after several years of uh, counseling, now Dylan understands this. <laughs> but I tell you what, from Dylan's, <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> but I tell you what, from Dylan's confused two year old perspective, he couldn't make any sense or find any redeeming value whatsoever to what happened to him in that moment. It just didn't make any sense. You see, Dylan was leaning his faith on me based on what was going on in his life in that moment, and it fell apart. And this is not because Dylan's a bad kid, right? Or not because I'm a mean, abusive, or evil parent, but because he leaned his faith, his understanding, his perspective through the lens of what was happening in his life right then. You see, we do the same thing with God, don't we? We do the same thing with Him. We view God and then we pass judgment on Him through the filter of what's happening right now in this moment or what we need to happen in the future. And then when we pull the lever and God doesn't do what we think He ought to do, we conclude that there's something wrong with God. God's broken. God's evil. God doesn't love me. God doesn't understand me. Where's God out right now? I'm, I'm, I'm by myself. And the truth is, if our faith is leaning on our ability to make sense out of our circumstances and how it all lines up, listen to me on this. Let me tell you, it's just a matter of time before it will all fall apart. But you see, thankfully for us, Jesus teaches us that our faith need only rest on one thing. And please listen to me on this. Only one thing. Our faith must rest on this one thing. Now I'm going to tell you what that one thing is in just a minute. But first we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. And before we read this, I just want to set this up for you a little bit, okay? You see, this is referring to the early Christians who were confused about when Jesus was coming back. If you don't know, Jesus promised after he ascended into heaven that he would come back one day, and that's called the second coming. And, he, and these early Christians were confused about the timing of that. They thought he was coming back very soon, right? And when I say soon, they thought he was coming back like in the next 15 minutes, maybe the next week. It's like, you know, don't sit down or buy green, green bananas soon. It was like really, really soon. Which is great because these early Christians were facing mucho persecution. So yeah, I mean it was a hard life they, what they were going through. So all these Christians were kind of like standing there in their front yards with their little bags packed and saying, woohoo! Jesus is coming back. Life is good. But then hours went by and no Jesus. And then hours turned into days and then weeks and then months and then years but no Jesus. Jesus didn't come back. And so they're just standing there and, and thinking, okay, well maybe, maybe I, uh, I heard him wrong. Or maybe I did something wrong. Maybe he lied to me. Or maybe my mama was right. I never should have turned to this cult to begin with and believe this whole Jesus thing. Maybe it's just a myth and bunk. And so a lot of these early Christians began to lose heart and to lose their faith. And some began to throw in their Jesus ch chips all together and say, I'm going home. I'm taking my football and I'm going home, right? I don't believe this Jesus stuff anymore. It just feels like God has abandoned me. So here we go. This is Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, then let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. You see, this is saying if all this Jesus stuff is true, if all of it is true, if it's valid, then don't give up. If Jesus is who he says he is, then don't turn away. You can trust him. Matter of fact, if Jesus, you see, if, I, if Jesus is the person who came here 2,000 years ago, if he did come down from heaven, if he did die on a cross, if he was buried in a grave, and he came out of that grave and ascended into heaven for our sins so we could be reconnected back to the Father, then hold on. If you have faith that that is true, hold on. Hold on to your belief in him. So you see, our faith cannot ride with our emotions because they are so unstable. Our emotions change with the breeze. They're unpredictable. Nor can our faith lean on our circumstances or become dependent upon what God might or might not do for me tomorrow. I mean, if my son survives the shark attack, attack or not. Yet my faith must lean on one thing. What is that? Jesus, right? 
Jesus Christ. And if I put my faith in any other thing, person, religion, or philosophy, then it will not work. It's like a house of cards, and it will collapse eventually. And I have to tell you as we wind down here, it's not the stories that I hear about people who have everything going their way that really moves me. Not so much. I mean, if your family member received miraculous healing, or you won the lottery, or you have a loved one who came to know Christ after years of turning away, that's great. I mean, don't get me wrong, that's absolutely awesome. But you know, it's the stories that people tell me about when they've been trying to have a child for years, and nothing. Or the wife who has a husband who won't go to church with her, who's abusive and struggles, you know, with the, with every, including addiction, who struggles with everything, yet they still have faith. That's what gets me right here, right? The stories, and I know a lot of things are going on in this church now. A lot of you have so much on your life, so many burdens in your life right now, and you're thinking, God, where are you in this? Where are you right now when I need you the most? And it feels like he's way over there. Hold on. Just hold on. You have no idea what God's going to do with this on the other end. That's having faith in a God that still moves, that's still there, who still loves you, okay? So there you go. For the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking and examining some real hard questions that we all, all of us, including pastors, all of us have about faith. And it's going to be tough, but I promise you, it's going to be worth it, okay? Now, you know, just, just, just to say this at the end, I, 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 know, I know a lot of us, again, are going through a lot of stuff. And um, I'm going to offer you right now, and I, I would ask Jeanette and maybe my wife to, to come up here as well. You know, this is a time where we come together and we do pray. We're not praying for God to, we're not rubbing his belly as a genie. We're not, we're not saying that he's, you know, he's, he's going to do some magical things for us right now, but we're praying to be inside God's will. We're praying to have God's peace. We're praying that God will be a part of everything we're doing. We're praying that our faith will be stable. Now, our faith will, and God will see our faith, and God will bless us with that peace. So now, I think Sam's coming up. Where did Sam go? Sam, come over here, brother, and Sam's going to play a song. And I just want to offer this right now. Um, we'll do this before we do the offering. If you need prayer in your life, I would pray that you would come up here now and let us pray with you. Because I tell you what, there's power in that. There's power in having, having a faith in God where you don't see what the, income, what the outcome is going to be. I can, I can promise you that. And as we get into this, this, uh, this series a little bit more, I'll tell you a little bit more about my, my personal story and what that looks like. A lot of you don't know it. But I can promise you there have been times in my life where God's, you know, I felt that God left the building. God didn't do these things to me, but I felt like, okay, I'm on your team, God. What are you doing? I'm doing this for you, I think. Where are you at? And it really shakes us to our core. But I promise you, I promise you everything I've got that God wants to bless you. God wants to give you some things that uh, you don't have in your life right now. I'm not talking about material things. I'm not talking about financial things. I'm talking about peace. There's the prosperity ministry there. God gives you peace in this. And God will walk with you through all this on the other end. So if you have a prayer this morning, I just pray that you come up and let us, let us pray with you.
I know a lot of people are hurting today. I know a lot of things have happened this week. Sam has, has had this a, a terrible week. He hasn't shared all that with you. Um, it hurts me as a, as a pastor sometimes. You know, I'm, I, I hear what's going on in your life and I'm praying for you. And I, I, I want to help you understand what the next steps are going to be. But the one thing I do know that's going to happen is that God will never leave you. I can't give you the answers. I can't tell you what's going to happen the next day. I wish I could. I'm a, I'm a dude. I like to fix things. I wish I could do that and tell you how God works, but I can't do that. But I can tell you this. God will give you peace. God will give you peace on the other stand of the other side of this, regardless if it's a health issue or it's a relational issue, financial issue, whatever's going on in your life. God is bigger than any of that. God's bigger than anything that you have going on in your life today. I promise you that. Have faith. Have faith in Him, that He is a God of miracles. He's a God that's capable of doing anything, and His will will be, will be known, and will be fulfilled. Just have confidence in that. Have confidence and faith in a God who loves you just like that. Be courageous, as the band sang earlier. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come here to, together as, as your body, um, as we're exploring what our faith is leaned upon. Lord, I just pray that, you know, first and foremost, that our trust and understanding of, of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came here and gave it all so that we could have life, that that's an, an unwavering faith. Yeah, we can be knocked off our donkey sometimes. And we can, we can see things, and you know, they just, in our present circumstances, they just don't make sense. Lord, you are the one stable thing, the centrality of all of us. You know, it was put this way in our life group this week. Uh, and Brother Josh told us about the God hole that's inside of all of us. And it's true. When we try to shove everything else inside of that hole, except for you, it's never going to fit. So I pray this week we're examining that. And we're leaning more on you. Not on our own understanding, but leaning on who you are, as the scripture says. Lord, that is my prayer this week. And now as we transition to a time of tithes and offerings, Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to you know, be an, make an impact in this community here. To make an impact, and regardless of what we're doing, I'm not looking for credit, don't want any credit. We just want to do what you would have us do. And these tithes and offerings help us make, be able to make that be a reality. So Lord, as we give today, let us give with glad hearts, knowing that you're going to do amazing things with it on the other side. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.